Hello and welcome to our SPQR bootcamp. This is a video where you will learn the rules and we will clarify the rules and make sure that you understand the meaning of the rules. Uh, there should be two videos. One will be the basic mechanics of the game and number two will be some advanced details of the game like heroic talents and how the campaign runs, which is not really part of the game, but it's a good add-on to the game. In this bootcamp, when we go through the rules, I will have some figures out here, and we will walk you through page by page of the rules, clarify and explain each rule, and put it in layman's terms and make it so that it's easily understandable. In this first video, we're only going to cover the first 27 pages of the book, which is the rules. All right, let me adjust the camera and we will begin. All right, let's start off by talking about what the game is. SPQR is an ancient war game. It's a game set in a classical period where you have soldiers in armor with shields and weapons and slings and bows and and spears and axes and they're going at it against each other and the players control their armies or or war bands or uh, whatever you want to call them to maneuver and position themselves to be in the best position to win the game there are scenarios where you can take on different variations to that theme but in general it is a classical war game with miniatures mounted on bases, you're rolling dice using a ruler to measure distances. You have terrain on the table for visual and for obstacles, and maybe it gives you cover or assistance. And it's visually appealing. It's a reason why miniature war gamers play miniatures and not board games, because board games have hexes and squares and it's very limiting and you have to use their you have chits that are flat this is not chess or checkers you have free form movement so there's no blocks or squares that you have to be in or move in what do you need to play well you got to have an opponent unless you want to play solitaire you have to have a play playing surface like a tabletop or the floor if you'd like uh, a selection of miniatures, 28 millimeter, 25 millimeter, 28 millimeter is the scale the game is designed for. Uh, Warlord Games makes uh, quite a few models for their own game, but there's also other manufacturers out there like Victrix and Foundry and Agema. There's just a bunch of different other miniature gamer companies out there that make miniatures in this period and in this scale. You'll need either a tape measure or a ruler. Uh, you want it to have a minimum of 12 inches. Several dice, and there we use six-sided dice in SPQR. And maybe some scrap paper to jot down notes or jot down your unit characteristics so you don't have to constantly look in the rule book. Okay, there is a there is a, a quite a few different things that could cause you to have to re-roll your dice. Uh, if you re-roll, you can't re-roll a second time. Now, before I get off of the re-roll, it does specifically say any given player may only ever re-roll a specific die result once. Okay, so what they're saying here is if I have a way to re-roll my attacks because I might have something to re-roll misses and you have something to or the opponent has something to make me re-roll my hits that's perfectly fine let's say I'm rolling and I only get let's say three hits then he can come across and I get to re-roll my misses let's say that's an ability that I have and let's say I got a couple more hits, then he could say, I need you to re-roll those hits, and maybe I only get three hits. So I was able to re-roll, 
and he was able to re-roll, but from one player, I can only use one, because what if I have two things that let me re-roll? You can only use one re-roll per player. In SPQR, you can always pre-measure your distance. Universally accepted base size for SPQR is one inch. You will see in the, in the rules, it specifically says each model, man-sized or small, smaller, is placed on their own individual base. That base is one inch. It is also circular. It's a circle, not a square, not a rectangle, not 20 millimeters, not 30 millimeters. 25 millimeters would be acceptable. The reason why that is is because when you measure from a model to another model, you measure from the base. If you had smaller bases than I did, then your units could be closer together and you could have more models in a smaller area. If I had a large base, let's say I had a giant base like this, then I would cover a much larger area when I measure. So you want everyone on the table to have the same size of base and the universally accepted size is one inch. Now some larger models might not have bases like the elephant or some other huge model like a chariot. Elephants come with bases, so use the base. A chariot doesn't necessarily come with a base. Use, use judgment on making the base size for that. You wouldn't measure to the base anyway. You would measure to the model. So you can make your base as big or as small as you want. It's irrelevant because that chariot, you're measuring to the chariot itself, the horse or the body of the chariot. You're not measuring to the base. Whereas a man-sized or smaller creature, you are measuring to the base. And cavalry would be best placed on a pill base. The one inch wide by two inch long cavalry base that you see Warlord Games has with the rounded front and the rounded back, that's for cavalry. Okay, so let's talk about units. There's infantry and cavalry. That's it. There's infantry and cavalry, people walking on the ground or people mounted. If you're, there's also heroes and minions. Heroes are units and minions are units. Minions have to be in a scale of five to 30. Five to 30 is the size. So yeah, you could have a unit of five guys. Now the majority of your units, because they are they don't have any facing, they're mounted on the round base. So you don't have to worry about what, what which way they're facing because they can move and maneuver in any direction they wish. But when it comes to a phalanx, like if my Macedonians formed a phalanx, which they cannot form with only six figures, but if they were able to, and they formed a phalanx, then at that point, they do have a front facing, a side and a rear. We'll get into phalanxes later. Now your models or your units or your troop types all have characteristics. They have a move inches, they have ranged, melee, melee dice, that's how many dice they roll in melee. They have agility, which is very rarely used, bravery, armor, and the number of wounds they have. And all models have these characteristics and they are listed in your army lists, what those characteristics are. Uh, they also have a denarii cost. Denarii is the point system that they use. Basically, if it's 50 denarii, think of it as 50. That would be money, but and, and you are buying your troops with denarii, but they're also points. Think of it like points. And you will choose with your opponent like how many denarii you want to play, like a 500 denarii game, a 750, a 1,000, or what have you. Your move is how many inches 
you can move in one move action. Ranged is the modifier to your die roll when shooting ranged. Melee is your modifier when in close combat. Melee dice is how many dice you roll when engaged in melee. I mean, these are all self-explanatory, right? Agility is your ability to perform actions that require agility, which there's only like one or two, and it's like jumping over a chasm, things like that. Then there's bravery. It's basically how mentally tough your unit is. Armor is a score for making armor saves against ranged weapons such as arrows or melee. If it has a secondary score in parentheses, that is for arrows because you might have a different armor for arrows or missile weapons. And wounds, that's how many hits it takes to eliminate one model. Now in the rule book, it, it disclaims the requirement for a one inch base, etc., etc. You can have multiple, you can take your Hail Caesar models with four models on a base and, and say that that's part of your war band, but in practice, it's, in, it's not practical and uh, it's kind of gamey. So this is me interjecting my own personal opinion. If you already have a collection and you don't want to rebase them, that's fine. But if you have the opportunity to rebase them to play SPQR, I would do that. And I have done that. Okay, so the, the game turn. The game turn is a you go, I go type of game. But it's not that simple. You cannot just go, you go, I go, you go, I go, you go, I go. That's not how this game is played. You have something called the dice of fate or initiative, if you want to call it, impetus, whatever you want to call it. But in this game, they call it the dice of fate. Starting on turn two, because on turn one, the scenario dictates, or a random roll determines who moves first, who moves second. Okay, that's the first turn. You almost always set up three feet apart. Because if you have a four foot table and you both set up six inches in, you're three feet apart, 36 inches. Slings have the largest range of 30 inches. And if you're setting up at exactly straight across the table at six inches in, you're 36 inches apart. And if player one moves six inches or 12 inches, that's the only time that that slinger is going to be able to attack you on turn one. Okay, at the start of the turn two, with the dice of fate, both players roll a d6, and whoever rolls highest has fate on their side. When you have fate on your side, you do not have to go first. You can opt to go second and force your opponent to go first. This does two things. This is a strategy. It does two things. It prevents your opponent from going back to back. And it gives you a 50% chance of going back to back. Because, let's say you win the initiative and you make them go first. They move, you move. Now you roll again because you roll initiative every turn. Now you might go first, and then you can charge. You have to decide if you want them to go first or if you want to go first. Maybe there's an objective that need like a, a chicken you got to get, and you want to go first because you want to get to that chicken. I get that. But if you don't want them to go back to back, make them go first. On your turn, you activate units. Remember, a leader is a unit. A war band like this is a unit. When it's your turn, you activate each of your units one at a time until you're done. They each get two moves. 
or two actions. One of the actions, or both of the actions, can be move. You can also have them shoot twice. You can have them melee twice. Special actions, there are a few of them, but the most common one is to prepare a sling to shoot. Okay, I've heard some people say, oh, that's the same thing as having to load it. You have to load and fire. That is not the case. It is preparing, it takes two actions to fire a sling. So you cannot move, say you're already loaded, and then shoot. That's not, that's not the case. You have to perform a special action, preparing your sling to fire, or building up momentum, wheeling that sling around, and then fire. A bow is not like that. You load, fire, load, fire. Okay, so a bow can fire twice. A sling can only fire once, and you have to be stationary. There's also something called compulsory moves. At the start of the turn, right before you roll any fate dice, before you determine who the phasing player is going to be, all units that have compulsory moves move on that turn, at the start of that turn. Then you roll the faded dice, you alternate your, you know, one player does his, the other player does theirs, and then you get ready to do the next turn, compulsory moves happen again. If there's ever an, a, ch a check needed, you just roll a die, add your modifiers, and you're looking for a six. So uh, if I have a plus two and I roll a die, well, I got a six right there, that's good. A six always succeeds, a one always fails, no matter what your modifiers are. Now, if I had a plus three and I rolled a three, then I would have a six, which is a success. Opposed checks, both sides roll a die, whoever rolls highest wins. If it's a tie, re-roll. Right, let's talk about movement. One of the actions is movement. Every unit has a move score. That's normally six inches, but, or depending on if you're cavalry or what have you, but infantry would have six inches, and it might be modified by what armor you're wearing. Armor will tell you if you can move five inches or if you can move six. Uh, you do not have to take the full amount. Let's say this unit has a move of six. I do not need to move six. I can opt not to move six. Okay, let's pretend... This guy is there, and this guy is there. So you're looking at kind of a column almost, right? And you got to be wary of this, because players might not know what they're doing. This guy can move six, so let's move him up six, right? That's a move action. And then I go to move all the rest. You'll notice that players don't measure. They just pick the models up and put them where they think would be good. Now imagine me doing that over here. I just moved 10 inches with that guy. Can't do that. One way you can alleviate this, uh, one way you can speed play, let's say you got a, a force going this way. Move your back guy first. So he's six. Now, if you're trying to form up or make a line or something, well, now you know how far you can move. But if you're still, but if you're trying to form the line, maybe facing this way, you can always bring him out to six. Now you know. Now he wouldn't. Yeah, he'd be able to make it to right there, right? And then this guy could make it to there. And you notice he cannot make it to the other side, so I would just put them in there or something like that. Don't be caught up with the rubber band effect. And they all have to be within one inch of another model in the same unit. So don't take this guy six inches and then this guy 12 inches. That's a big cheat right there, right? He should still be back here. 
you have to you cannot move faster than your slowest model it doesn't matter which way they face this guy can move this way this guy could move that way this guy could move this way as long as when you're done they're all within an inch of each other he's probably too far out terrain will have effect on this wargaming that's what we do we like to give three-dimensional terrain like woods or buildings or hills or swamplands or marshy or rock or something like that if it's clear you get your full movement that's pretty obvious if it's an area that you consider difficult terrain like woods ruins barricades steep hills they get half their move they also get half of their melee action okay a melee action is a move a normal move six inches with a bunch of attack rolls that's a melee action impassable terrain guess what don't have to say anything dangerous terrain let's say it's possibly lethal with pits and rivers and vegetation with carnivorous animal life um, you're not really going to see this on many of the games but who knows uh, if it's lethal you have to make an agility roll or take a wound equal to the failed check. So if they have an agility of plus one and they roll a two, the total would be three because of my plus one, which is three different than a six because you're always looking for a six. I would take three wounds on these guys. Most models have one wound. Heroes and the Spartans have more and some terrain like trees and buildings grant you cover but we'll talk about that during combat two special type of movements which is climbing and jumping if there is a way to climb like a ladder stairs rope ropes whatever something where you can climb you cannot just say i'm going to climb you can ascend or descend one level with one move action, with all models ending on a flat surface. So none of this stuff. Jumping. You can jump across a gap that's half your move or less. And this, maybe you're, maybe you're on a roof and you want to jump to another roof, and these guys can move six. As long as that roof is less than three inches apart, you can jump over to it. If you attempt to jump further than half your move, up to your full move, then you'll have to make an agility check or fall. All right, now let's talk about combat. There's shooting and melee. To perform a shoot action, you must be armed with a ranged weapon, such as a bow, a javelin, a sling, something like that. You cannot shoot an enemy that is engaged in close combat. So if they're already in melee, you cannot shoot them. You must have line of sight or at least part of it. This means you gotta bend down to the table's height, look at the model's eye view, and as long as you can see part of the target's body, flags and banners don't count, then the unit is in line of sight. And you can check the range. And units within the unit, models within the unit, do not block line of sight. Now every range weapon used for shooting has a range characteristic. Measure in a straight line from the base edge of each model in the attacking unit to the edge of the base of the closest model in the target unit. Okay, so let's say that these guys are kind of like, and let's say this unit is kind of deployed like that. Not a great deployment, but let's just say. What you do is you have to measure each of these models to only the one model, the closest model. So this guy is about 13 plus, you know, this guy is under 12, this guy is about 13, 11, 10, 9, okay, as you work. And every model that's within range may attack. So let's say this unit had a 12 inch range. He can shoot, he can shoot, he can shoot, he can shoot, he cannot shoot, he cannot shoot. So I would be attacking with four guys because they're all within range of that one guy. When you're looking at characteristics or a stat line, 
Weapons will have their own stat line. It'll show the name of the weapon, like a javelin. They'll have a range, like 10 inches. And then they'll have some special rules, because every weapon modifies die rolls in some way or another, like lethal or one shot. So here we go, we're gonna make the range attack. So once you've selected the target unit, you check to see if you can see them. They're in range. Now it's time to unleash hell. And remember, every die that scores a six or more is a successful attack, but they may be modified by the ranged attack table. Every successful attack will deduct one wound from the target unit. As with all rolls, a one is a fail, a six is a hit. And if a model is reduced to zero wounds, he's removed from the table. He's dead or very badly injured. Very badly injured comes into play when you're doing a campaign because you can recover wounded. Now here's long range. This game simplifies long range in that in, is that any of these four that are firing, any one of them, if they're more than half range, then they're all at long range. And they get a minus one. So even if, and remember it's a it's a 12 inch range, or it's a let's say it's a 10 inch 10 inch range, and a bunch of them are within five, but this guy's at six, you're at long range. Because you're at more than half. Or it could be a large target. If you're shooting at a warband that has 10 or more models in it, it's considered large. And you get a plus one to hit them for every 10. So if I had a 20-man Gallic warrior tribe coming in and you shot at them, you would get a plus two to hit them because there's 20 of them. If there was 19, you would only get the plus one. If there was 30, you'd get a plus three. Okay, let's talk wounding just for a second. If I shoot and I kill a guy, you remove the guy closest to the, to the shooters first. Work your way back. If, and for every wound that kills a guy, right? Now, what if these guys are Spartan warriors and they have two wounds each and I shoot? And let's say I do three wounds. You kill the first guy because he took two and put a marker or something on one of the guys or the unit. You can say the whole unit has suffered a wound, right? And then the next time we shoot, if we only do one wound, you remove the closest guy and take that wound off because that would be his two. You do not give or allocate wounds to everybody. No. You remove models and then the remainder is what you put on the unit. And you're putting it on a unit, not an individual model. And they say in the book, armor. It's either foolish or insanely brave who go into battle without at least a little protection. Okay. When you hit with a range attack, then it makes an armor check to see if it can negate that damage. Note that a one for armor is always a failure no matter what your armor score is. And a six is six or more is needed. Okay, so let's say I got three wounds over there. I got three hits, right, after my total. And then what you do is you just take up the three dice and he rolls for armor saves. And if any of them are a six, that's a wound he negates. And then he only takes these two, which would kill that first guy. Or two guys, if it's not a... And we'll go into the armor checks later when we get into equipment. Cover. Okay, so let's say you're behind a fence, you're in the woods, you're in a building, you're on a battlement of a castle. You're going to have two types of cover. You're going to have light cover. You're also going to have heavy cover. It depends on what kind of cover you and your opponent deem that it's correct. Okay, so light cover gives people 
a minus one on their attack rolls. Heavy cover gives them a minus one on their attack rolls, but also gives you a plus one on armor saves. So cover is minus one to hit, period, but heavy cover gives you an extra armor. All right, let's talk about melee, right? The melee action. Okay, I'm going to say that these guys are over here, and these guys are over here. They can't form phalanx because they don't have the number of troops, and we'll get into phalanx later. Uh, we're not going to worry about heroes just yet. I'm going to leave them off the... Remember, in SPQR, you can pre-measure. So I come up here and I go, ooh, look at this. This guy's not within six. That guy is. That guy is. He's not. So these two guys are definitely within six of these two guys. These guys are out of range. Do I want... When performing a melee action, a unit moves into contact with one or more enemy units. So, because there might be another phalanx here, another phalanx here, you can move up and hit both of them. Like, if it's unable to do so, or maybe its move score is not high enough, then it becomes an ordinary move instead. Because remember, you get two actions. The first action doesn't have to bring me into contact. I could bring guys out with six inches to prepare for the charge or the attack, the melee action. Now, a unit using a melee action must try to get as many of its models as possible into contact with the enemy unit. And if you can't get into contact, you get as close as possible. Now, when moving as a melee action, you obey all the rules for the terrain under the move actions. All models must still be able to form an imaginary chain, one inch. Okay, so in this case, let's go ahead and make a, a melee action move. This guy makes contact. This guy makes contact. We knew that. This guy does not make contact, but he is ready. This guy does not make contact, but he's trying to get up there. He's trying to get up there, too. These guys are trying to get up there, and they maintained the one-inch gap between all the troops. But right now, only these two and these two are in contact. Now, here's where the rules deviate. The book says... Every model in the unit fights, and every model in the unit fights. In the errata, it says only the models that are in base-to-base -base contact fight. Both sides fight, and it is simultaneous. And remember, any die that scores a 6 is a hit. For every 10 models in the unit, a plus 1 bonus is added to all the melee checks. So if you have a swarm of 20 guys charging in, everybody gets a plus two. Skilled fighters. Okay, this is where you compare the attack bonus to the attack bonus. If a unit has an attack bonus that is more than double your opponent, then you get a plus one. Uh, basically, you're just so much better of a warrior than they are. Um, that's usually going to be against peasants or commoners. When you take casualties, you take them from the farthest unit. It's a little bit different than ranged attacks. You pull this guy off, it's assumed that he steps, like he died and this guy stepped up. So you pull him off, or you pull him off. It's assuming that they fill the gap. When you attack multiple units with one unit, because let's say... These three are a unit. And let's say these guys are a unit. And this guy was able to make it there. Let's say he fills the gap there. So let's say they were able to do this. Because you're only counting the models that are in base-to-base -base contact, it doesn't matter. 
these two guys get to fight back, these two guys get to fight back, and these two fight them, and these two fight them. So it's not like you're combining all the dice. There could be many instances where multiple units are engaged. Uh, if that's the case, you fight those individual battles uh, like normal, uh, removing from the back, like I said, and then uh, at the end of your melee action, let's say it was Roman's turn and he charged forward, at the end of that melee action, if both units are not, if either unit is not eliminated, then you are locked into combat and you cannot move. Uh, but you can do another melee action. So in this case, if I was going to do a melee action, uh, this guy could theoretically move forward and contact this guy. And this guy could move forward and contact maybe that guy. And you could get, or I don't think he could, he could get there. I don't know. He can't get there because now he's breaking the one inch rule. So he's going to have to engage one of these two guys, probably this one, to get uh, all models in contact. And then you do the round again. Because remember, you get two actions. If I use a melee action, let's hypotheticalize this. Let's say I move up in my first action. We fight. Nobody dies. On the second action, I decide I'm going to move. Now, these guys, remember, are locked and they can't do, can't move. This guy comes up and he says, OK, I'm going to extend the chain and I'm going to extend a chain. All right. So these four guys fight. Those two guys fight. These two guys fight and those two guys fight. Remember, these guys are not in base to base contact. They don't fight. Let's say, hypothetically, nobody dies again because they're just horrible at fighting. At that point, this unit is finished, and you, the Roman player will move on to another unit, move and attack, move and attack, right? If I had a second Roman unit over here, let's say, and I moved up and attacked those three guys would get to fight back because you fight with whoever's in contact. You can fight more than once. So let's say, uh, let's, let's kind of trick the game here a little bit. Let's say these Spartans are Macedonians, actually. They're Macedonian phalangites. And let's say there's two Roman units. And this Roman unit moves up and fights these guys. Right? Da -da 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 -da. Everything's done. We're done. The Roman still has to act with this unit. So he moves up. He's going to charge over here. Let's say he gets hit like that. This, these two guys fight back. Now, he's already fought twice with this guy, and now he's fighting twice with this guy. It doesn't matter. It's all a brawl. Just because I'm rolling twice doesn't mean they're only attacking you twice. You're swinging left, you're swinging right, you're making multiple attacks. It's all in the matter of a round. Don't try to limit it by saying, he shoots one arrow. That's an action. No, he probably shot three or four arrows in that action, but there's only one die roll. When he charged up and you made your one melee attack roll, that doesn't mean he only says, okay, I'm going to run up and I'm just going to attack you once. Bank. No, he's like fighting all over the place. Okay, or stabby, stab, stab. As long as you are engaged and, and one side is, or both sides are not dead, you're locked into combat, can't move. But you can flee. So a player may decide that his unit has no chance against his opponent. Perhaps he's inadvertently placed his unarmored archers in close combat with the mighty hero. When locked into combat, you can choose to perform a move action. However, before your unit can move, every enemy in contact 
gets an attack. So basically, it's like D&D. You get an attack of opportunity. And the moving unit is not using a melee action, so it does not get to fight. He has to move. If it survives, it continues to move. If you're in cover, let's say that this unit is behind a fence or a wall or dug in a ditch or something like that. But let's say they're in cover and you charge them or move into contact with them, I should say. You use a melee action. The defender can, should, force you to re-roll any successful hits. So you hit with five. He says, no, re-roll. You roll again. You only hit with four. The four are the ones that actually hit. And that only applies to the turn in which they moved into contact. Once he's in contact, he doesn't suffer that penalty again. It's assumed they've climbed over or jumped into the cover. Now, there is one last action. It's a special action. It's called hiding. Uh, if you declare your unit is hiding, it can't move. It, uses, it has to use two special actions to hide. If it is behind... Yeah, so this unit, because it's in cover, it can use two of its actions to declare that it's hiding. So when a unit traces a line of sight to them for ranged attacks, they can remind the player that they're hiding and cannot be shot. As long as at least half the models are obscured by the terrain granting the cover. So let's say this guy's poking his head out they can still be hiding because they got more than half their guys in cover. Now you'll only hide on the turn that you spend the two actions to hide. If you get double phased, like I go last and then I go first, you're still hiding. Your hiding doesn't wear off until your next phase. All right, now that was video one, the basic rules of SPQR. Come back for our second boot camp where we do advanced rules.